when when we talk about the uh, the conflict between mankind and thinking machines or thinking cre th thinking creatures that are not machines this is something ancient we could you know we could track it back to the uh, to the golem or to Frankenstein uh, we could also think about all the mythical creatures that in many in many mythologies there are myth there are creatures that were formed by humans either uh, directly or inadvertently and eventually cause damage to humans so I think that what really uh, lies in the at, the at the core of this discussion besides the halachic problem the halachic problem is only one facet of it uh, one aspect I think that what we have here is a very very deep concern of mankind of being dethroned being uh, sort of like uh, losing our uh, position as the uh, as the crown of creation or crown of evolution, how, whichever way you look at it, right? We tend to think our, of ourselves as the most intelligent, powerful being in the world, humans, and we're afraid that artificial artificial intelligence is going to take our place. So I, w I want to have this in mind as we analyze the teshuva, uh, and I think that in a very in a in an ironic way. This is also something that is happening right now as the human race is pitted against the coronavirus. I think that for a lot of people, maybe subconsciously, there is something that bothers them, and that is how is it possible that this tiny virus uh, is able to defeat mankind is it smarter than us will it grow smarter than us in the future right so there's a there's a there's a grain of ego and and arrogance uh, uh a pride here uh vying for power so i want to look at this uh, at this article i sent you the i sent you the link and you can look it up on your screen if you want uh there it is um i'm going to uh, enlarge the text in a second. I want to go first to the beginning. This is a teshuvah that was prepared by the uh, uh, the board of rabbis of the conservative movement, and we're, we're not looking at it just for halacha, just to see the sources and the the the, the style of discussion. Uh, and here, this is something that uh, Professor Miller uh, presented last week. I'm going to reread those questions. Uh, and then go through the responses, only highlighting certain paragraphs. And since you have the article, you know, you could read the whole thing and we could discuss it by email or in other forms. So we read this. With rapid advances in the development of artificial intelligence and autonomous machines have come calls for moral machines that integrate ethical considerations into analysis and action. What halachic principles should apply to the conduct of such machines? Specifically, one, are Jews liable for halachic consequences of actions taken by machines or their behalf? For example, Shabbat labor. It's a good question, right? What happens when an, an artificial intelligence, autonomous machine performs work for me? Not a new question. Seems like to be a ramification of an, uh, an existing problem, and we'll talk about that. Should ethical principles derived from halacha be integrated into the development of autonomous system for transportation, medical care, warfare, and other morally charged activities, allowing, allowing autonomous systems to make life or death decisions. Now, this is not a uniquely uh, Jewish question. The previous one is also, we could say, not unique. We, they phrased it, framed it within the, uh, the scope of halakha, but really we should ask, uh, is anyone liable for is the creator liable for an action of, a, of an autonomous machine? Is the uh, founder of Tesla or the engineers who created the car, are they liable for a Tesla that crashed? Uh, the famous crash in, uh, I think in Florida it was, we'll talk about that. Um, then the ethical principles, again, not something that is particularly Jewish. Three, might a robot perform a mitzvah or other halakhically significant action? Is it conceivable to treat an artificial agent as a person, as a Jew? So it's more than one question. And of course, we'll have to see what, uh, what type of mitzvah or halakhically significant action we want that robot or machine to perform for us. Um, 
So now I'm going to go skip to one paragraph in page two to, and read this. Some ethicists dismiss the entire project or fashioning ethical artificial intelligence as misguided. It's too big. Uh, as misguided regarding the embodied uh, experiences of suffering, pain, pleasure, and mortality as essential context for moral reasoning. Or in other words, saying that how can a uh, how can we try to project to uh, or to uh, attribute moral re uh, reasoning to machines when they cannot uh, have the uh, the feeling and emotions and uh, and experiences that we have. <clears throat> so there are two problems. Here. One is the uh, the failure of defining artificial intelligence. This is exactly what we're talking about. When we talk about, uh, if we talk about artificial intelligence, we are not talking just about uh, a machine that is able to perform something in the way a human can uh, perform it, make decisions, uh, cook food, even though it doesn't have taste buds or, 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 or et cetera, et cetera, but rather an intelligence that could really process and understand the full scope of human behavior. So that is uh, inherently built into the idea of artificial intelligence and what the ethicists who are working with the companies are trying to do. Um, the other problem is, and that is something that runs through all these discussions, uh, Jewish or non-Jewish, when we talk about the ethical behavior of machines is, uh, I would say a bit of a hypocrisy and that is, uh, we are trying to argue that we are, as human beings, perfect. There is, there is a hint of that argument, right? Or at least the designers of those machines should be perfect humans who always take into consideration all the elements of, uh, of human existence. As I have shown many times in, the, in our classes, even when you talk about rulings by great rabbis, scholars who work with communities and with people all over the world and whose work is invested in, in logic and reason, but also emotions and they have to analyze the text and answer uh, halakhic questions to people who stand in front of them. In many cases, there is a shortcoming of that rabbi for not being able to fully understand and assess the situation of the person who's in front of him or her. I'm sure I know that some of you have experienced situations like that. Uh, that is very common in halakha. So to pretend that you know, we want to create this perfect machine that will be the perfect human that never exists, never existed, that already is a, a, a premise that is, is problematic. Um, I'll add one more thing, you know, when you when we look at uh, this kind of halakhic discussions that talk about what ethical decisions should be taken into consideration when you program those machines. Uh, I don't know how much uh, weight does those, do those discussions have in the actual development of those machines? Do they really look and say, okay, call the rabbis, the leaders of the conservative movement or the reform movement or the, the orthodox movement or the Bedini Yerushalayim and the imams and the muftis and the, and the pope and whoever is in charge, right, on, on each uh, of each religious denomination and say, we want to hear from you what you have to say and we'll put it in. I doubt it. I mean, they might consider something, but eventually scientific truth or scientific ethicism uh, will rule. They maybe will pretend to uh, to do it in the way uh, the religious movement did it just because they, we need to, uh, I would say, appease the crowds because people who are religious who want to know, it, does it, do we have a religious approval? So I don't know how practical this discussion of ethics is when it comes from the religious, uh, uh, from religious groups in a, in a place where they don't really have an impact because it's not a decision of the individual how to develop 
that particular uh, machine or, or intelligence. Right, Rabbi, could I ask a quick question about that? Yes, That's a good point. Um, if, if when it comes to creating halakha, considering new advancements in technology or new realities, not to say that we're removing halakha, old halakha or changing halakha, but simply adapting to the environment, um, would it, not to say that we, we wouldn't want to consider it necessary, but I guess we could ask a straightforward question. Would it be considered necessary for them to do that? And, but while instead, we could simply rather see what they produce because it's produced based on the, the leading science and say, we have to make decisions halakhically based on the, the most advanced knowledge that we have. In other words, make our halakhic decisions based around the science instead of them coming and saying, hey, what's your input? And let's change, let's, let's change right. the robot in considering your halakha. Right, that's a good point. And something that I brought up with the, uh, Professor Milner last week, uh, he quoted Rabbi Navon, and uh, Rabbi Navon who works with Mobileye, to which to me, this is really, this is the, uh, the role model, the, something that we have to look at, someone who is uh, well-versed in both worlds and totally understands the, uh, uh, not just understands, but is able to, to program or create or invent. And unfortunately, we have very few halakhically committed Jews who are in that field. So that's where I say, you know, something is missing when we come from the outside and we say, okay, we're going to tell you how to do that. Um, I think that, uh, I don't know how many people uh, in, the, in the rabbinical world, even, even among those who wrote the, the Teshuvah, because I, I read through it, I'm, I'm not uh, placing judgment on anyone, uh, but how many people are aware of the challenges of artificial intelligence, what does it entail? You know, how far are we from developing uh, a uh, machine capacity or comp computational capacity for a computer that will equal one human brain? Uh, and also, the the one of the main problems is that human, um, and this is something that constantly comes up in conversation uh, of program. And I'm I'm talking from you know the 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 perspective of a lay person, you know, as far as I understand, right? Uh, thinking about the, the, even though I did study programming in the, the ancient past, it, what, I, what I studied was COBOL and Fortran and Artran. Uh, so I did the uh, devil in that, it's interesting. Uh, it's like a Gemara, just a little bit more boring uh, if you could, you know, get the language. But uh, one of the main problems for artificial intelligence is that humans are not, we don't think in a programmable way. You could brainwash a person uh, and that person will be almost a machine, but we're, we're not programs. The, uh, we don't follow a predicted pattern. Contrary to what uh, I think it was either, uh, it probably was Watson, the one of those, uh, the two scientists who discovered the double helix, he said, if you give me the position of every atom of the human, of, in the universe at the time of the Big Bang, I could predict the course of history to the end of time, right? Because we believe that every uh, act of a human being is predictable. If you, apparently he never lived with humans, right? If you ever interacted with the human, you know that we are un unpredictable. But this uh, unpredictability is not just you know, uh, an erratic uh, behavior that someone who knows the person very well would be able to, to anticipate. Rather, something that is built into our brain, we have, uh, we have, we could repossess areas of the brain in a field that's called now neuroplasticity is studying that. We could uh, redirect areas of our brain to do different tasks, but also every time we approach a problem, there is a we could say, you know, it's very, again, very, uh, very simplistically, there is a direct path to solving the problem, but when we cannot do it this way, the brain would come up with three or four other ways to go around it, meaning the brain is, is flexible and, uh, and, and constantly changing. So for a machine to be programmed by a human is a problem. So now we're working on a process called deep learning or neural uh, networks where uh, the machine learn from their own experience, but we are still a long way from uh, working with the machine that have this kind of ethical uh, abilities. Okay, I'm going to go back to the text, uh, and and uh, I just made this comment just as a, as an opening. Uh, 
I want to go here to page three and read this uh, paragraph here. Uh, an opposite problem is that the border between natural and artificial intelligence is eroding. With the integration of biological and manufacture deliberative systems well underway, already people make momentous decisions with computer assistance, and such integration is expected to advance into more seamless and permanent forms. Algorithms, the direct internet searches for information are generally hidden from the user. Our decisions are unconsciously guided by the presentation of results. Machines regularly complete our sentences and even our thoughts. Humans depend upon artificial intelligence for a bewildering array of activities from navigations to financial investment to healthcare decisions. Da, 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 da. Okay, uh, this is true, right? We used to know how to drive from one place to another. Now we don't even bother remembering uh, the, the way. We used to remember, we, people used to know how to spell. Now we don't know how to spell. If the spell checker don't fix it for us, we're frustrated. Okay, what happened? Why are you not fixing it for me, right? That's, it's true, those things are happening. But uh, it's not a novelty. That's, that's why I always say history is important. To, to pretend that in the past we made decisions and the decisions were our own is false. I'm not talking about personal decisions, but something decisions that impact societies. Humans were always in a situation where you had few people, small groups that held most of the powers and told other people what to do and how to think. Take, for example, religious establishments, right? Any, any uh, I would say fanatic, but more close-minded religious establishment, whether it's Jewish or Christian or Muslim, we're talking about thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of humans who are being told what to do, who are uh, who are sent, whose sentences are written for them. How many times you, were, you, you spoke to someone who's, I don't, I don't say brainwashed, but totally entrenched in their position, and you felt that that person is not talking from here, but rather spitting out prefab sentences. It's, I'm just saying that we want to look at the problem. We're just shifting an existing problem and we're focusing it on this uh, issue of artificial intelligence. And I want to apply here a concept that exists in the natural world, uh, again, from a layperson's perspective, uh, and that's called uh, the, the concept of the Red Queen. I mentioned it before. The Red Queen is a uh, character from uh, Alice in Wonderland. In the second book, Alice Through the, through the Looking Glass, there's an episode where there's a there's a seat in that episode. There's a paragraph where, like thinking movies, and you know, uh, there's a scene, there's a paragraph where the the Red Queen is running very fast, and Alice is running next to her, and she's asking her breathless, "Why are you running so fast?" And the uh, the Red Queen answer answers is is because everybody is running fast. So we have to run to stay in place, okay? So you're not really, you're not going anywhere. Everybody's running together. That means you're always on the same page with everyone else. And that is something that happens in the natural world in, the, in terms of evolution. Even now, what is happening now between the virus and us, right? We made an advance against the virus, SARS, whatever it was before, the flu and other, so the virus I was making in advance. Now we are, we are going to make a, take a step forward and beat that virus. And the virus will take a step forward and beat us again. And now we have to, it will go back and forth constantly. Matt Ridley wrote, wrote the book about that, uh, the Red, Red Queen, the role of, uh, uh, is it the role of sex in, uh, in evolution or something like that? But that's the name of the book. Uh, something similar, I think, happens between men and machines. Because... Uh, in the, at the same time as machines are progressing and becoming more intelligent, we are also becoming more aware of what machines can do and more aware of what we need to do to control them. So this is an ongoing race. Yes, Eduardo, have a comment. In fact, we have uh, at the moment some impacts derived from the different algorithms. For example, 
during the Jewish people history, we have, uh, we can found different philosophers, for example, uh, Hillel uh, versus Shammai. And due this contrast, we have two different schools, but we can also study two different point of view. And due, due this fact, we can grow up, grow up our um, background, our, our Jewish background. Uh, however, the current algorithms uh, reinforce our uh, preconceitos. Preconceived? Uh, uh, reinforce this. For example, at the moment, the world is very polarized because the algorithms reinforce our uh, Uh, our preconceitos, preconceitos. Uh -huh. um, que preferencia? Uh, que, que, que decir? Yeah, our preferences. Uh -huh. And if you would like uh, Trump, for, if you if you like Trump, and you put Trump, okay, algorithm um, understand that you love this guy, and mm -hmm. every every publication will be about Trump, and you never can uh, assume the other position. This fact can impact directly the Jewish people because if you like, for example, Chabad, you type Rabad, just the Rabad will uh, look for you. Mm -hmm. And the world is not just Rabad or just uh, humanist Judaism. And this is the, the current impact in Jewish world. Yes. Uh, thank you, Eduardo. Uh... So this is true, but it's not, I'm not saying that we don't have, you know, the current technology doesn't impact us or doesn't, but what I'm saying is that is a, there's a constant, like a pendulum that moves from this side to another. The more the, you know, there'll be an impact of machines on us or the Facebook or social media, the more that we will uh, be, be, be willing to learn more about what is happening and, and, and take a stand and make an impact. Um, but still, I'm just highlighting here some of the issues, uh, and I want to go to another paragraph in this book, in this uh, in this article. This is on uh, on page four. Uh, our greatest concern is uh, with the development of uh, AMAs, that's uh, artificial moral agent, that possess high levels of both autonomy and ethical sensitivity. So to develop a machine with a high ethical sensitivity that will be, will be given, you know, uh, total control, this day is far, far away. Uh, and maybe the humans that will deal with these questions will be much better equipped than we are to deal with it. Um, but anyway, the goal of fashioning machines endowed uh, with high autonomy Uh, is already within reach, lending urgency to the project of developing ethical sensitivity with an artificial system before they can operate without uh, human supervision. I think that, that, that line, our greatest concern is the development of AMAs that possess high levels of both autonomy and ethical sensitivity reinforces, reinforces what I said before in the, at the very beginning that the real fear is, are we going to have to deal with superhumans that we ourselves created, right? The fear is, is there going to be out there someone smarter than us as a, as a total, as a whole, as a human race? I'm just going to uh, highlight the, the, the perspective. And this is something that is uh, maybe subconsciously, subliminally uh, written here. I'll go to one more paragraph here on page six. Uh, Hey, Bram, I was yeah. just saying, in the contrast, we can have something that will um, prevent us from, you know, destroying ourselves. That too, right. So I want, to, I want to talk about that, exactly about that. This is the next paragraph that I'm reading. It's just the PDF on the screen takes, uh, you know, its own life. One of the strongest ethical defenses of autonomous systems, whether vehicles or weapons, is the fa fallibility of human operators. This is something that I mentioned last week, right? Humans are bound to fail. Uh, driver error causes 90% of the over 30,000 vehicular deaths and many more injuries annually in the United States. 
for all the familiar reasons, drunkenness, drowsiness, distraction, rage, and general poor judgment. War fighters, soldiers, suffer from these same fallibilities. Fear may further impair their judgment. Robotic war fighters presumably will lack these deficits, but they are likely to experience other challenges, especially in discerning intent and in differentiating combat combatants from non-combatants. As noted, there's been little progress in equipment AI with understanding the meaning of a situation beyond the matching of data patterns. Will an armed robot be reliably able to discern between a child holding an ice cream cone and a soldier pointing a pistol? In its speed and efficiency, will the system fail to allow, allow ambiguous action to be clarified? So that seems to be a very good argument. And on one hand, the, the de defense of, uh, of artificial intelligence is those machines will prevent human error. On the other hand, they say, would weapon yielding machines or you know, uh, AWS, autonomous weapon system, uh, will they be able to discern between uh, uh, an enemy and an innocent person, right? So in other, in other words, we are, we, we're asking a question of, there are several elements here. Uh, I think one is sort of what we call the greater good. If I could prevent 90% of the accidents in the United States, right? So 30,000 vehicular deaths. That means that instead of 30,000, we'll have 3,000, right? So 27,000 less deaths. Uh, does it justify creating a machine, uh, a let's say an autonomous uh, a car, like a Tesla, that could prevent all these accidents, but once in a while might cause a de uh, an accident that otherwise would not have happened had there, been, had there been a human driver behind the wheel. Remember the, I think it was about maybe now two years ago, uh, we all lost uh, the concept of time here in isolation, uh, but there was a, a, a Tesla that crashed, I think in Florida and everybody, maybe even more, uh, now, if there was a, it made a big, uh, a big splash in the news. Everybody was talking about that. Do you remember the case? People remember that? Rabbi, right, what was worse is they had a human driver there. <laughs> it, it was. There was a human driver in the car. I know. Now, but when you study the case, you're what happened with this? What happened with this? Uh, with this case, there was a uh, a guy who drove his Tesla uh, ceaselessly, meaning he he did more. A mileage on this car in a month that people do in a year. So uh, the probability of him, you know, uh, crashing grew, and he was using a technology in an un uh, in an uncontained environment because ideally, uh, fully autonomous driving machines would only be allowed. In a in a closed environment, like an uh, uh, an experiment that is being run in Pittsburgh, where they close an area of the city only for autonomous vehicles. So, what we had there, the crash be between a truck, semi trailer, and this car, already involved a human driver. So that's one problem. B besides that, they had greater mileage on the car and uh, uh, and a human driver. the The problem with that uh, crash was that. Uh, uh, a truck was coming out either maybe to the other lane or crossing and uh, the uh, um, the trailer was pure white. It blended with the sky. It was horizontally in front of the Tesla. So it read it as a, just like some of you are blending with the, uh, uh, you know, with the virtual background, it blended for the car. So it, for that, it was just a piece of sky and it kept driving through. Okay. So that is definitely a concern. And the, and, and the concern is, are we allowed to make such decisions? Can we say, for the greater good, let us introduce a better driving machine that will save lives, even though this driving machine could perform some mistakes? We, would we say, could we make an equation not knowing who is going to be affected by the accidents? Because as we well know, everybody could be affected by an accident, right? It could happen to anyone. Should we say that it's okay to cut 27,000 deaths if the, in, in the United States, even at the price of 
1,000 other deaths? Or should we say no? Those 27,000 people who were destined to die by accident because of human error should die. And we cannot sacrifice for them a thousand other people that otherwise would have survived. Can we make, can we make, I, I think it's a valid statement. I want you to, why, why would it not be uh, a valid statement? I don't know. I mean, you can say, you can, you can use the same argument for the thousand people. I mean, maybe they were destined to die also. Right. Well, Rabbi, an, uh, another yeah. machine that we currently use are ATM machines. Even though, even though they sometimes break down, sometimes they make, you know, they may spit out money or make whatever. It's, it's a lot less than human error. So you right. need to use them. Right, but I want to add to this also that we make these kinds of decisions all the time, but we allow ourselves to make them because only humans are involved. Think about, for example, countries that decided to, uh, to have a full quarantine or not, right? This is a, this is a, uh, uh, a game gambling on human lives. You say, okay, I want the economy to work. Some people will die. And some people also are clamoring for that. They say, yeah, it's okay for us. We want, we want the economy to open. It's okay if some people die. And some will even say, let it wash out the, you know, the elderly and the frail or the poor, I don't know. Uh, but not only that, you think about, take the, the, the atomic bomb, the H bomb, right? Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Was it necessary? Were both necessary? Was one necessary? Was there another way right, to, to minimize damage? Don't we do it all the time when we, uh, when, or you know what? Why am I going to such, uh, you know, uh, extreme examples? Let me go right, read one, once again, this, this line where they talk about the Robocop, okay, let's call it. Will an armed robot be reliably able to discern between a child holding an ice cream cone and a soldier pointing a pistol. Can anyone who have been following the news in the last couple of years tell me if you heard of something like that, not involving a robot with a weapon, but a human with a weapon? Uh, how about a human with a cell phone or a toy gun or any number of scenarios where somebody got shot mercilessly. Exactly. Some Policemen do training all the time. What? Policemen, Policemen do training all the time for this. Police is doing it all the time. And sometimes the police officer is innocent. We have to say that. We have to admit sometimes they are not. Sometimes, we know, I know we, I'm, I'm following cases there were a police officer who after a while committed suicide because they couldn't live with the thought that they killed the person. And they said, we were under tremendous pressure. You don't know what's going to happen next. You know, they train, train them through scenarios. Uh, uh, I've, been, I've been in the army for a short while, but I, and I spoke to other people, to soldiers who had to kill someone, even when they, they uh, or had to make decisions split second. And, and they were terrified when they did that. They, they keep having thoughts afterwards. They never know, you know, in, in some cases they know that that was a necessary action, but not always they know that. And those mistakes made by police, that, I'm talking about the, the, the cases where there's no bias, where there is really human error. The, the, the person moved in a way that looked suspicious and someone reacted because he wanted to defend someone else, it happens all the time. And this is what I just wanted to show that, uh, you know, taking those questions and uh, sort of nailing them on, on artificial intelligence is in a way hypocritical because we are claiming that that doesn't happen to us. And it happens to us all the time. Now, the, uh, to be fair with this question, what we need to do is to do maybe to perform a thought experiment or uh, a serious study of the impact of changes in our behavior by the introduction of certain autonomous machines. Uh, so the, uh, let's talk about uh, cars, right? <clears throat> 
if if you had a okay, those people who live in New York. I lived in New York, congested city. I lived in uh, in LA, congested uh, city and highways and everything all around. I lived in Bogota, where the term congested does it doesn't even apply. I don't know what how to describe it. You know, you had uh, there were four lanes on the highway and six cars driving at you know at all times, just like they found space. Uh, and you know, it's, it was basically just like you know. Uh, you need you can get out of the car and push with I know with the shovel you push your car to the other side I don't know uh, how people manage that right now think about autonomous cars it goes way beyond just all of us each one of us owning an autonomous car and driving to work this is the thing where the fallacy lies because what we do and uh, and this is also something that happens with halacha it happens with uh, everything <clears throat> that changes from one system to another we just take the old system and apply it to, to the new system. Meaning, when we think most people, even the rabbis who wrote that, I would say some of them, when they think of, uh, of self-driving cars, right? They think of our, our reality today with self-driving car, right? So for example, uh, people in New York, people in other places, families who own two or three or four cars can just as, uh, roads. The only difference is that the the traffic is autonomous and maybe communicates with the traffic lights, and there's a little bit less congestion. But that's not that's not the vision. The vision is, and it will take time, and it will start with cities within small clusters. The vision is that you have a city or, or environment where only autonomous cars are allowed to drive, and they're autonomous and smart, meaning they communicate, they communicate with the roads, they communicate with traffic lights, they communicate with central control in the city. And therefore, not each and every one of us has to have a car. There could be less cars on the street. There could be more public transportation. And, <clears throat> and is it, I mean, there would be no you know, parking spots, traffic uh, police, all these things will be reduced and you take all these resources and you invest them somewhere else. We're not talking about a local change. We're talking about systemic changes. And yes, they will come with the cost. But to uh, minimize it to the question of, will this car make a mistake and kill someone? It might happen. To, can we claim that the machines that we built never killed anyone? Think about the, the plant in Fukushima. Did it kill people? Right? Was well, a machine, a smart machine that needed the human input that wasn't there? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go back to the text. We didn't even get to, I don't think we even got to the halacha part of it. So since I'm talking about the really in general terms, it applies everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> one more thing before we get to the really halacha. All this is, it to me, is a nice, a lot of abstract discussion. Um, but really not specific to halakha and more, in my opinion, expresses the fear that we have of the rise of the machines. Uh, and I think a lot more needs to be, to be done uh, before we could have a discussion like that. Uh, here, in page eight. Wait, <coughs> Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi. Mashiach. Yes, yes, Maddie. Before you go on, what you just said about the fear that is the real basis of the resistance to any kind of acceptance of these things. It's yes. the same reason people don't wear masks in public. It's the same reason that people gather in big congregations, even when they're told that it's dangerous to do so. And it's not the fear, <clears throat> excuse me, of what's going to happen to them. It's the fear of the lack of control that they have over what's going to happen to them. If cars are driving by themselves, it's a lack of control. That challenges our superiority, as you said before. I just had to stop you because you just realized no, no, no. that. And that's like the most important thing yes. about everything that you've been talking about so far. Right, right. Yeah, thank you. I mean, there's something that I, that I mentioned before and I t totally agree with you. We have a very, very deep, deeply seated fear of losing control. And we all have it. I know for me, you know, when it's, I mean, first of all, uh, many, many people have this fear of flying, you know? You know I'm afraid of flying? Because you cannot bring the, the plane down. 
You know, you cannot lend it. You depend on someone. You're suspended between, you know, heaven and earth. And if you start thinking about that, what if everything, you know, it's scary. Uh, and I know because my wife is one, of, she, she is always uh, uh, anxious when, when we fly. But she's also anxious when we drive. So I'm the, I'm the autonomous driver, right? And, and my wife sits next to me and she watches the road and she warns me. And I said, please, I have, you know, early warning system. Don't add to it, right? Uh, and, you know, she, okay, we, we try to, to make a deal. Um, and I, I said, could you, you know, you get nervous because you see the traffic coming at you. But if you trust me, right, thank God, I've been driving in America uh, for many, many years uh, and didn't have any accidents except for one time in LA when someone made a left turn and slammed me and ran away. Well, I'm on the highway, Baruch Hashem, on the highway, never had a problem and I did a lot of hours on the highway. So you could trust me, right? Just based on my uh, uh, past experience. Could you close your eyes for 15 seconds when I drive and not look at the road. I say, I have total confidence when you drive, I'll do that. <clears throat> she can go for more than four, four seconds. She says, it's okay, it's okay, I'm not looking. I'm just, but I, I, right? So there we go, Maddie, like what you said, we, we are very, very afraid of losing control. And for me, I'm okay with airplanes where I do have this fear of not being in control. And I confess is roller coasters. No matter what my kids will do to convince me to go on one, I said, thank you very much. If it's about adrenaline rush, I grew up in Yerushalayim. I got all the <laughs> adrenaline rush from going on a bus and praying that it wouldn't, you know, blow to pieces. So uh, that's, that's the roller coaster for me. Oh, anyway, I'm going for me too. I, I was on a roller coaster once that my wife made me go on with my daughter. <laughs> I was nauseous for three days afterwards. Never again. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's go back to the article. I want to read this. This, I think, is a very, very important uh, paragraph. Again, in my opinion, the, it's a failure to see that we're talking about an ancient problem and this uh, sort of a, a, a false attempt to pin it on artificial intelligence. An additional area of concern relates to fairness in machine learning. Bias is not inherently problematic. Indeed, the ability to discriminate between different subjects and situations is the foundation of learning. Our concern is with discrimination that leads to an unjustified bias or one which has been declared morally irrelevant. Why, why do you think I have a problem with that statement? That we have a concern with fairness in machine learning. In other words, we are concerned with the people who program the machine or you know, have the input for those machines will be biased and they will create Betzalmo, the machines in their image, and those machines will be biased. <clears throat> and why do I think that this is a sort of a, a I don't want to say false argument, but you know, maybe misplaced. Again, because we pretend that we are not biased. Have we solved all the problems of bias in the world that we can now say, okay, uh, hold that research until we make sure that you can make your machines fair and unbiased. Think our about lives the are filled with civil bias. wars that are, I tell you, Shana, yeah? Our lives are filled with bias. Just right. look at Halacha. Yeah. No, you don't, you're not trying to say that the halakha discriminates against you because you're a woman. No? No, okay, thank God. <laughs> and I was concerned for a second. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think, for example, I'm thinking again, someone who grew up in the Middle East uh, and who lived in Israel through the first Gulf War uh, and had my, I had my baby daughter in an oxygen tent, uh, you know, during the uh, during the air raids, we had this little. Uh, they call it mamat, uh, that where we had to put her in. She was screaming, and we had to put, you know, feed her, like put the bottle with the and all that because we were afraid of chemical uh, warfare. Um, what was really strange about the, this Gulf War was the swift reaction of the United States. 
right? Uh, compared with the inaction in other places. Why was it so important to, to stop Saddam Hussein from taking over Kuwait? Well, I think, I think okay, maybe I'm not a you know, political scientist, but it seems very probable that it was because of the oil and the importance of Kuwait as an oil producer. Other countries are not as lucky. You, go, you look around the world. This is, this is bias by the governments of the world. Some, uh, we care about some uh, tragedies. We care about some wars. Or, you know what? Flip it. Forget about Kuwait. Forget about the, uh, you know, Saddam Hussein. Look about what's happening to Israel. Now we can talk as an Israeli. Is there bias against Israel? But whatever we do is not right. Whatever we do is not right. Uh, <clears throat> so to say that our concern with machine learning is whether the machine will be biased. I mean, we are biased. There's no way to, uh, uh, I mean, we're, we should continue our research, of course. We should make machines that, that take uh, and factor all these things uh, into their decisions. But we really have to first call on the government of the world, on, on, on uh, people in leadership positions to, um, to deal with bias. Okay, now I get to the, to the halacha um, that is really discussed in this uh, article, even with, though we're a little bit towards the end, but there's more to discuss here. And here they talk about shlihut, about appointing a shaliah, a representative, to do uh, my work. So before they present the question that we read this, what can be done to make machines operate on a level that is at least as moral as that of beneficent, beneficent humans, avoiding the pitfalls that lead people to misjudge and discriminate against one another. That's highly subjective, right? Who is that good, you know, uh, beneficent human who, uh, who would be the, the yardstick for the machine? Given the lack of consensus about ethical principles and the pressing need to develop guidelines for the conduct of autonomous machines equipped with artificial intelligence, it is imperative that wisdom traditions, such as Judaism, contribute to the general discourse, just as it has participated in discussion of bioethics and other matters of public policy. So this is a political statement, that we want to have a say in how you design your machines. Okay, go ahead, send people to universities to study those uh, sciences and make them involved in the process. Don't come and say, you have to listen to us. I, I do agree that we have, I think we have an amazing uh, system of moral values, but I also agree that our amazing system of moral values have been, has been abused by groups of power. Like Shana said before, within the religious world, there are many, many groups that are discriminated against. Um, and there's a book that I mentioned before by Jonathan Haidt called The, the Righteous Mind, where he speaks about moral values. Fascinating research by, I think he's a, a evolutionary biologist, but it also touches on psychology, maybe a psychologist, uh, where he shows that when we talk about moral values, we all, believe it or not, we all share the same moral values. All humans share the same moral values. There, um, he mentions five universal values alongside religion. How is it possible? The, and, I, and I'm just really distilling it to something very, very simplistic. The, uh, we use a combination of those five, they're basically uh, five parameters. They're not absolute values. It's just like when, when uh, uh, you adjust the, uh, the audio system in your car and you have uh, uh, travel and bass and, you know, and other elements and you could, you could play with them and then the, each, you know, the sound will sound different. The same is with, with those moral values. We all use the same moral values, but we play, the, we play them out differently. Religion, religion is one of these values and it is important according to evolutionary biologists, to anthropologists, to sociologists, it is important for the development of mankind because it creates bonds between people. It creates some kind of recognition of who we are, uh, hope, etc. But it could also be abused because uh, once uh, we uh, surpass a certain number of people in a group, 
then we start forming subgroups, and the people who are in the other group are not good enough. Ideally, for you know people in the group to be together, that one when humanity was uh, of much on you know, a much smaller scale, would be 150. Um, but you could see that as um, how religions treat each other and how religions treat one, uh, you know, other factions within themselves. So to make this general statement, like, you know, the wisdom of Judaism is dangerous. We have to, uh, we really have to solve the problems within our religion, within our, with people, with humans, before we go deal with artificial intelligence. To me, the core question of, and we'll get there, of artificial intelligence is practical. Can I use it on Shabbat? You know, can I prep privately uh, do certain things with it? But those uh, ethical questions, we are still we are still far from them. I'll give you one more example, and I want to open to to more questions because I'm sure people have questions and comments. I said in the beginning, this is an open, you know, uh, but I don't think we need more uh, interaction here. Um, I have a comment. Thinking about, wait, Chena, I, I just want last statement, and I want to hear everyone. Uh, the the um, the conflict between you know different religions is constant, and a lot of people are involved. People here also, people that I know, are involved in interfaith uh, effort, bringing people from different religions to be together, and it's beautiful. So about two weeks ago. Someone sent me a photo, a picture of the two chief rabbis of Israel together with the local imam or mufti and the Greek patriarch of the Orthodox uh, Church in Yerushalayim and another uh, Christian leader standing together in a circle on the backdrop of the old city of Yerushalayim, just like Ariel, and uh, they are praying together for the well-being of uh, people who are affected by the coronavirus. It's beautiful, right? But I wrote back, I said, I want to see those rabbis, the chief rabbis, standing in prayer together with a conservative rabbi and a reform rabbi. And he wrote back to me, this will never happen. And this is where we, uh, when we, when we talk about the, the values of Judaism, we ask ourselves, what is happening to us that you know, we, could, we could create those interfaith dialogues, but we have no interfaith dialogues, right? So uh, we just started. This is like really a fascinating topic, but I wanted mostly to, uh, I could say if I want to take, for me, the, uh, the maskana, you know, the conclusion that I, the lesson I could take from this is that we have to define the question, are we, when we talk about artificial intelligence, are we really concerned about how those machines are going to uh, behave? Or are we concerned about superhumans that will be stronger and star smarter than us in which our faults will be displayed on even, on, on even a larger scale? So we'll conclude this here and I'm open to question before we continue for uh, Arvit.